Today's speaker, as was mentioned, is Dr. Mark Johnson, and Dr. Johnson serves as the senior pastor of Independent Bible Church in Martinsburg, and is actually the host church that helps uh, care for uh, the expenses of this conference, and it's a, it's a blessing to have him. Uh, Dr. Johnson speaks at um, our, our master's classes and, and uh, uh, comes down. He's done graduations and a lot of things like that. If you've not heard him, you, you know, new students or freshmen, um, you are definitely in for a treat here. We've been looking forward even to um, this particular series for a while and in communication. I keep telling him, can't wait for him to come as we look at the life of Christ is, is, is uh, such a foundational thing for us here at a Bible college, but as Christians in general. But Dr. Dr. Johnson is a, is a, a longtime friend, a graduate, as was mentioned, you know, of ABC and uh, sends uh, lots of students and uh, points people our way to help um, come and prepare for ministry. So, Dr. Johnson, we are looking forward to this, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. It is a great joy for me to come back to Appalachian Bible College. I am uh, so thankful for what I received here and for what God continues to do here. Coming back here makes me feel young to be with you students. It also makes me feel old because I know how long it's been since I was a student. I think it was um, before Noah's Ark, but we are surviving. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson, for your leadership. And uh, it is truly an honor to be here. Also, um, uh, I have the privilege right now of being known as uh, Alex Sheldon's pastor. So, Alex, I have something for you from your parents that we can get to you later on. It's an immense privilege for me to give lectures in honor of Dr. Joseph Pinner. The entirety of my undergraduate theology was at his feet, uh, and then in a, a senior seminar as well. And for decades, that was true for all of us who attended ABC, that we had all of our theology classes from Dr. Joseph Pinter, who was precise, who was passionate, and um, thorough. And what a legacy of hundreds of uh, pastors, missionaries, Christian servants around the world that uh, Dr. Pinner has taught the theology. Uh, but in addition to his excellent instruction, I was impacted by his character and by his personhood. Um, it truly adorned the doctrine of God our Savior. Um, we did do some traveling together on Gospel Heralds and then back and forth to uh, Charleston for one semester, and I got to listen in on those theological conversations and other conversations, and I was um, amazed at his approachableness, his humility, his transparency. He was a sweet role model of a godly husband, father, servant of the Lord, and left an indelible mark on me, which at the time I didn't fully understand, but appreciate all the more now. Dr. Penner's life has demonstrated that a big God theology will produce a happy, effective, joyful, impacting servant of Christ. Thank you, Dr. Penner, for your ministry. My assigned topic is Christology and the life of Christ. It is the heart of of what we as Christians believe, and it is the heart of what shapes our lives. In my limited time, I want to talk today about Jesus, the Son of God, tomorrow, Jesus, the Son of Man, and Wednesday, Jesus, the Disciple Maker. The lectures, I think, are posted somewhere online, so if you don't get everything down in your notes, uh, my manuscripts will be there for you. Christians affirm that Jesus is the Son of God, but don't misunderstand that terminology 
when we as humans talk about father and son, first you have a father, later he has a son. Not with God. God's not like us. We cannot fully comprehend him. I mean, we can't even explain where did God come from. In the beginning, God. He didn't come from anywhere. He's always been. And that'll blow your mind, let alone in his very person, the triune God. Dr. Pinner, I believe, did his THD dissertation on the Trinity, and it does stretch our minds and call us into worship. We are baptized into the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is Christian truth but it's greater than our minds can fully comprehend. One God, one person, one God, one being, three persons. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, you try to explain that. How are you with someone, and yet you are that someone? When you're talking about the Trinity... That's the way it is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John said, we saw his glory. The term is incarnation. And the incarnation literally refers to the in-fleshing. If you want to remember incarnation, a silly way to do it is chili con carne is chili with meat. Incarnation is God in meat, God in flesh. But it's not just his body, it is human body and human nature, fully human. The eternal second person of the Trinity took on humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, in his classic book on miracles, called the Incarnation the grandest miracle of all. Quote, the central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. Every other miracle prepares for this or exhibits this or results from this. The incarnation was the central event in the history of the earth, the very thing that the whole story is all about. It's a miracle that surpasses human comprehension. The creator entered his creation. The eternal entered time. Down he comes, down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down further still to the womb, down to the very roots and seabed of nature that he created. But he comes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with him. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. Of course, Philippians 2 calls believers to humbly serve one another, not in selfishness, not in arrogance, not in conceit. But in lowliness of mind, uh, consider others better than ourselves to look on the interests of others. And then the motivation for doing that, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what follows was probably an early Christian hymn that Paul quoted because Christians have always been singing about and praising the Incarnation. It's one of the richest Christological passages in the New Testament. And in honor of God's word, let's stand for the reading. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's talk about this passage that tells us that God the Son became a man. Verse 6 and 7, what God the Son left for us, who being in the form of God asserts Jesus' preexistence. Being is present tense Greek, speaks of continuous existence as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, form of God. Now the word form, Greek morphe, expresses the essence or the essential being or nature of something, the morphe. The Son is God in His essential being. That babe in the manger was God. Yet, He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The term considerate robbery refers to a clutching or seizing like a robber would. He didn't clutch his equality with God, his existing in the form of God, selfishly. It refers to a divine decision in eternity past to give up the free exercise of his rights and the free display of his glory as God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus is God. They assert that Son of God means a God, small g. It's the old Arian heresy from the third century that Jesus was divine, but he was created by the Father, a created being. And yet, jot down John 12, 40 and 41. There, the Apostle John quotes from Isaiah 6, the vision of God, Jehovah on the throne. And John 12, 41 asserts, these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. And the antecedent of the him in John chapter 12 is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah God on a throne. Holy, holy, holy. Share that freely with Jehovah's Witness if you have an opportunity. Now, when the text says he made himself of no reputation, it uses the verb kanao, emptied himself, what theologians refer to as the self-emptying, the kenosis. But he did not empty himself of deity. God cannot cease to be God or he would cease to exist. He did not cease to be God. He did not give up any portion of his divine nature, his divine attributes. And so, of what did he empty himself? At least five things. First, of his heavenly glory. He left his glorious throne, the constant worship by angels, and his divine splendor. He came to the muck of this sinful planet. And while here in the prayer in John 17, he said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. He left that heavenly glory. He was homesick for heaven in John 17 and looking forward to being back in his father's presence. Secondly, he left independent authority. He was obedient to his father. Philippians 2.8 will say he became obedient. Hebrews 5.8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And even in Gethsemane, you remember, as he wrestled with the horror of the cross, the physical and spiritual death bearing our sins, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He gave up his heavenly glory, his independent authority. Third, he gave up his prerogatives of deity. He never gave up any divine attributes, but he gave up the independent use of those powers. 
When did he draw upon his divine attributes? And when did he not? When directed by the Father, John 4, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And when directed by the Holy Spirit, uh, John 12, I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. And this is why, as our church doctrinal statement says, and many doctrinal statements say, his earthly life sometimes functioned within the sphere of that which was human, and sometimes within the sphere of that which was divine. We're, we're trying to make sense out of what we read in the Gospels. We see his humanity. He was tired. He was thirsty. He came to a tree expecting figs on the tree, and they weren't there. But we at times see his deity. As exhausted in the boat, he stands up and stills the storm. Or feeds a crowd of thousands or knew their thoughts. He gave up the prerogatives of deity and at times functioned within the sphere of that which was human and at times within the sphere of that which was divine. He also emptied himself of his personal riches. Though he was rich in heaven as God, 2 Corinthians puts it this way, he became poor that you through his poverty might be made rich. Born in a stable. No place to lay his head. Working for a living as a carpenter. He gave up his personal riches and then he, number five, gave up his favorable relationship with his father for you and for me. He bore our sins. He, the Father, made him the Son to be sin for us. Our sins were imputed to him. And he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Martin Luther said, God forsaken by God? Who could understand that? But Jesus gave up his favorable relationship with the Father, the spiritual death, the separation from God on the cross. And so without ceasing to be God, he emptied himself of heavenly glory, independent authority, the prerogatives of deity, personal riches, and his favorable relationship with the Father. That's at least some of what's involved in this kenosis. But the passage describes not only what he left for us, but next what he became for us. Taking the form of a servant. And again, it uses the term morphe, form, in essence, essential nature. But this time it refers to what was added to deity, namely being a servant. Doulos in Greek, a slave. A slave has no rights of his own. A slave is successful by making someone else successful. And he was, as the prophet Isaiah repeatedly prophesied the servant of Jehovah. I think of the theme verse of the Gospel of Mark. He came not to be served, but serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Being taken the form of a servant, he came in the likeness of men. This indicates that he was truly human. Not just God in a human body. He was truly and fully human. The God-man. Theological term, the hypostatic union. Again, greater than our minds can fully comprehend, but 100% God, 100% man, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 16. Which indicates that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. He went through every category, every kind of temptation that human beings go through. As God, he could not sin. But as man, he could be tempted. Feel your mind being stretched again? He felt the full weight of temptation since he never gave in to it. Dr. Anderson and I had the privilege of sitting under Professor Ivan French at Grace Theological Seminary 
Dr. Anderson, before I was there, he is older, you know. But uh, Ivan French would illustrate it this way. Uh, Could he have sinned? Well, picture a dowel rod of wood that you could take and break across your knee. That represents his humanity. He could be tempted. But you take that dowel rod and you lash it to a crowbar. Let the crowbar represent his deity. And now you try to break that on your knee, and your knee is going to break. And so as man, he could be tempted. He could feel the full weight of what you and I go through in facing trials and problems and temptations on planet Earth. Yet, he could not sin, and he did not sin. Being found in appearance as a man. Is that just repeating the same thing? No, the word appearance reminds us that he looked ordinary. He looked human. He didn't have a halo. People looked at him and thought he was a mere man. That had to be humbling, don't you think? Knowing who he was, that he was willing to go through the suffering, the misunderstanding, the mistreatment, of being found in appearance as a man. Only once at the transfiguration did he let his divine glory shine through. And in Matthew 17, it says that his face shone like the sun for those moments. Peter, James, and John never got over it. Just read 2 Peter chapter 1. But that was the exception He was in appearance as a man. Probably one of the reasons people had so much difficulty saying, this is God. And remember that he's still a man today. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There's one mediator between God and man. What's it say? The man, Christ Jesus. He is permanently united with that human body and human nature even today in heaven, as he makes intercession for us. And one day we'll see him with those nail-scarred hands and be able to bow and thank him. Next, not only what he became for us, but what he did for us. Verse 8, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. As God in heaven, he could not have died. But as man, he became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our sin was imputed to him. He took our spiritual death so that his righteousness could be imputed to our account. His death as God, as Dr. Pinner alluded to in his prayer, was of infinite value. He himself is the propitiation, the full payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. But there's one more step down in the progression of what the Son gave up, what he became, what he did, and that is these words, even the death of the cross. This was rock bottom. To us, we see pretty jewelry of the cross, but in first century Rome, crucifixion was used for the worst kind of criminals. It was the most excruciating, by the way, excruciating, do you hear something in there? Crucifixion, cross, crux. It was the most excruciating, humiliating, degrading death ever devised. And he bore not only the physical and emotional agony and shame, but he died spiritually. First Peter 2, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And as he was separated from his father, a sin bearer cried out, my God, my God, not my father. He'd always had that fellowship with his father. But now when he's bearing our sins, God as his judge My God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? The king got off the throne, dressed in rags, and was born in a stable. The judge, if you will, got off the bench and went to the electric chair, the cross, in the place of the criminal. What a, what a God. What a plan. This Jesus. Philippians 2 declared that God became a man. We've seen what he left for us, what he became for us, what he did for us. Before we leave Philippians 2, however, and go to one more passage, I don't want us to forget what the rest of the hymn says. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, how many? Every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, the demons will bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have the privilege of bowing before him now in this day of grace. And getting this good news out to all who will come and to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. One day there will be many who have rejected Christ who will bow in judgment when it's too late. Even Satan will bow. Even the demons will bow. Jesus will receive the glory that he deserves. But I invite you to turn next to, uh, for the rest of our time, to Matthew chapter 1. And I want to look for uh, our remaining moments at the historical outworking of these realities. I think that would be good for our lectures Matthew chapter 1, the first chapter in our New Testament, begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. I won't read it all. We come down to verse 15. Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Matan, Matan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, feminine in Greek, was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, many wonder why does the New Testament begin with a genealogy? How boring. But for those who know their Bibles, we realize the importance of the family tree of the Son of God. It gave us the promised link. Adam and Eve sinned. And God stepped in immediately with a remarkable promise, remember, called the first gospel, Proto-Evangelium. Speaking to the serpent and Satan within the serpent, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel. A mysterious but powerful prophecy. Someone born of a woman would be the Redeemer and crush Satan and sin. And that becomes the storyline of the Bible. Galatians chapter 4, for example, recognizes the significance of that prophecy. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. Why does it emphasize that? That first prophecy, you see. And the Old Testament progression followed the promised line of the coming one. Through Seth, Abraham, Judah, David, and his descendants. And Satan, as you read through the Old Testament, tried to destroy that line over and over. A couple of dramatic examples. We preached uh, on the life of Elisha last fall, and leading up to Christmas, we were in 2 Kings 11, where Athaliah seized the throne and destroyed all the royal seed. The Davidic line. Except a little baby whose aunt hid him away. 
We called the message Saving Christmas. And Joash was the one living survivor of that line as the line of David hung by a thread, but God preserved it. I think of the book of uh, Esther, Haman, the enemy of the Jews, the anti-Semite, was out to destroy every living Jew on planet Earth. And if that had happened, that would have been the end of the Messianic line. Guess what? Haman lost, God won. While the Old Testament shouted, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, we come to Matthew 1.1, the link from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and it proclaims he's here. And he is Jesus, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He came from the proper line. We also see not only the promised link, but the covenant link. David and Abraham were featured because of the unconditional covenants God had made with them. To Abraham, God promised, Genesis 12, I will make of you a great nation, make your name great, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. I believe that Abrahamic covenant is still in effect, by the way. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that blessing to all the families of the earth would be through Abraham's descendant, the Messiah. Read Galatians chapter 3. And to David, God had prophesied, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Of course, Solomon would do that, but this prophecy is going to go beyond Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Keep in mind that in Hebrew, the term son doesn't necessarily mean one generation. It means descendant of. And so, a son of David will sit on God's throne forever. Amen? We'll look at that a little bit tomorrow from Daniel 7. So we have a promise link. We have a covenant link. We have also have a double link. The genealogy in Matthew 1, according to verse 16, was Joseph's genealogy. Fathers begot sons until, verse 16, breaks the pattern. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, feminine, was born Jesus the Christ. Joseph was Jesus' legal or adoptive father, but not his biological father. The royal Davidic line came through Joseph. The rest of Matthew 1 explains how Mary was Jesus' physical mother by miracle. Many Bible scholars believe, and I would agree, that the different genealogy in Luke 3 is Mary's genealogy. Uh, If you want to have some more documentation on that, you can consult my manuscript online. Because Mary's name is not mentioned, but Luke apparently followed the traditional pattern and didn't mention a female name, and we believe it was Mary's genealogy, which means that she was a descendant of David by David's son Nathan, just as Joseph was a descendant of David by his son Solomon. Now, Jeremiah recorded the legal royal line of David through Solomon had gotten so wicked that it was put under a curse. Jeremiah 22, 30, write this man, that's Kaniah, Jeconiah, also called Jehoiachin, as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David. Now what? God has a dilemma. Jehoiachin ruled three months, He was hauled off to Babylon and lived out his days, but that line is under God's curse. God solved the dilemma, not surprisingly, by having the biological link come through Mary, bypassing the curse, and the royal line coming through Joseph, and they would marry 
And Jesus would have not only the royal line, but the physical line bypassing the curse. He would have a double link to the line of David. It's an interesting study to dig in more as you have time. Legally, through Joseph, physically, through Mary. And it was a certain link. The Jews had extensive genealogical records. When they came back from captivity, check it out, Ezra 8, for example. The Jews in Jesus' time had extensive genealogical records, but no one ever questioned Jesus being the Messiah because he was from the wrong family tree. They had access to the records. They were well known. People did not reject Jesus as Messiah due to lack of evidence, but due to an unwillingness to repent and believe. The heart of the matter then as now is a matter of the heart. John 3, 19, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So the genealogy of the Son of God provides a promise link, covenant link, double link, and certain link. Next, when God became a man, he surprised us by lavish love. The family tree of Jesus, as recorded by Matthew, contains some shocking surprises that demonstrate God's love. God rose above gender prejudice. Verse 3, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. And Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. God rose above gender prejudice. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Jews didn't mention women in genealogies. Matthew did. God rose above ethnic prejudice. Three of these women were Gentiles. Tamar and Rahab were Canaanites. Ruth was a Moabitess, and Bathsheba was married to a Gentile, Uriah the Hittite. That's put on display here. And also put on display is the human sin. By deliberately mentioning these women, God was dragging out of the Jewish closet some sordid skeletons. Tamar seduced her lying father-in-law, Judah in Genesis 38, sad story. Rahab, before she believed and married into the Jewish line, was known as the what? Harlot. Ruth, the Moabitess, must have, it must have raised, she was a proselyte to Judaism, but it must have raised eyebrows in Bethlehem when Boaz married her and Deuteronomy had said, no Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the congregation for ten generations. And the men in the genealogy were sinners as well. I mean, the first verse listed David, an adulterer and a murderer. And Abraham, a cowardly liar, repeatedly. And some of Israel's worst kings are in this. It's jarring, if you know the stories. Ahaz, Manasseh, Jeconiah. The Son of God was sinless. But this genealogy identified him with sinners, reminding us that Jesus is the friend of sinners. He came to save sinners. A recent song that expresses this truth is called, O Come All You Unfaithful. O come all you unfaithful, come weak and unstable. Know that you are not alone. Come with fears unspoken. Come taste his perfect love. Oh, come, guilty and hiding ones, there is no need to run. See what God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. He's the Lamb who was given, slain for our pardon. His promise is peace for all who believe. So come, though you have nothing. Come, He is the offering. Come see what God has done. Come, all you unfaithful. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. My time is gone, and I want to encourage you to uh, read my last point in the manuscript online. To summarize, 
The rest of Matthew chapter 1 tells us that when God became a man, he amazed us by a miraculous method. Of course, the virgin birth. The virgin birth was supernatural, not limited by human means. The virgin birth was saving Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. The virgin birth was scriptural, fulfilling prophecy that the virgin would conceive. And the virgin birth was sovereign, God using human instruments. And Joseph and Mary obeyed and accepted the shame that must have come from the community and accepted the strange beginning to their marriage that Joseph took her as wife but did not have sexual relations until after Jesus was born, keeping her a virgin. They did have normal marriage and had children later, but God used human instruments in fulfilling his plan. What a God. God the Son became man, and that changes everything. It provides hope to all who will repent and believe, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What good news. It also gives us our purpose for living once we come to him as Lord and Savior. 2 Corinthians 5.15, that those who live, that's all of us believers, should not henceforth live for themselves, that's our default setting, live for self, but for him who died for us and rose again. There's your mission. Live for Jesus. God became a man. That changes everything. There's your purpose for living. Live for him. Heavenly Father, thank you for these realities which blow our minds and call us to worship. Lord, help us to love Jesus more. And to get this good news out to everyone we can. In his name I pray. Amen.